Hello and welcome back to the final episode of 12 Steps to Poker Heaven, the series that shows you the 12 ways to becoming a better poker player. I'm Carmel Thomas and with me today for the very last time is the very great player himself, Mr. Grupp Smith. Oh, thank you very much, Carmel. <laughs> kind words. I can tell you I'm literally aflame with enthusiasm. Still quite a lot to learn if you want to be a winner. So I think pay attention today is that's the key. It, that's it. Uh, throughout this series, we've taken you on a journey throughout poker. We've shown you the key areas and also many examples from great different tournaments. You've seen some great plays from top professionals such as Gus Hansen and Dave the Devilfish Ulliot. Yes, we have been on a thorough voyage through poker and this is the final hurdle. Keep paying attention though because there will be some valuable lessons in the programme ahead. So far we've covered pre-flop play, post-flop play, heads up, how to read tails, how to bluff, even game theory, the full armory of knowledge you're going to need to be a very successful poker player. But don't uh, switch off your attention just yet because in this episode there'll be even more valuable nuggets of knowledge. Absolutely, and I've learned a lot myself over the series, so you're obviously a very good teacher. Well, that is a proud <laughs> boast, and I shall be getting the chips in the cards out later on. We'll see just how apt a pupil you are. Absolutely. Well, let's find out exactly what the final two steps are all about. Coming up in our final show, we'll have step 11, how to win at tournament poker. Now, this is the holy grail. It really is the Grand Prix of poker. Then in step 12, we'll be looking at the importance of revision. And I don't just mean reading books. It's constantly analyzing how you've played hands, how people have played hands against you in the quest to become a better player. Because remember, poker only takes a few hours to learn, but it does take a lifetime to master. So then, what are the essential ingredients that you need in order to win a poker tournament? Well, it doesn't really matter if you're playing in the biggest tournament in the world, say the, the main event of the World Series with 8,000 runners, or you're just gathered around your kitchen table with seven of your pals. There are three things you need to have on board if you're going to profit in tournament situations, and that is skill, luck and experience. Skill, it's pretty obvious. You've got to get good at putting your opponents on hands, at knowing when the situation is right to raise, at learning positional play, how to be aggressive. These things you'll accumulate, but they are essential. Mm -hmm. Luck mustn't be overlooked. In a tournament situation, it's usually quite short term. It can be just one day, the longest tournament in the world probably only lasts five days. So it's not really a very great stretch of time. If you were to play for 10 years, of course the best player in the world will end up with all the money, because that length of time takes the element of luck out of it. But in a short-term situation, it's really important to be lucky. And then lastly, experience. You've got to give yourself a bankroll and play with it. It doesn't matter if you lose your bankroll. You've got to think of it as paying for your university education. You're using this money to learn. And the more experience you get, the better you will be at spotting tells, the better you will be at reading your opponents, and the better you'll understand the game. And then, of course, once you've got your degree in poker, you can go to work as a pro. Everything we've discussed so far is crucial to win a tournament. But what are your objectives when you sit down at a tournament? Well, when you sit down, you should have two things in your mind. The first is survival. You don't want to make any silly mistakes early. Remember, at the beginning of a tournament, the blinds are relatively low compared to the size of your chip stack. So you don't want to be busting any particularly aggressive moves because you'll be taking a big risk to win what's usually a very small amount. Mm -hmm. The second, though, is accumulation. As those blinds go up every half hour or hour, depending on the structure, they'll be worth winning. They'll be juicier, apples hanging from the tree. So they are worth competing for. And remember, you're not going to win a tournament by checking and being passive. Sooner or later, you've got to make some plays. And no matter where you're playing, there's certain principles you should abide by. That's absolutely correct. The first thing to watch out for is playing too many hands. Now, mm. you're at a poker table you want to gamble. That doesn't mean you should be getting involved all the time. If you find that you're playing more than, say, 20% of the hands, especially early on in the tournament, then you are asking to be sandbagged. Somebody sooner or later is going to be trapping you with a much better hand, because no one's that lucky. You can't keep entering pots and expect to get lucky. So be a little bit circumspect early on. Then we get to something called the gap concept. Now, this is a very useful piece of poker theory. Essentially, it means that if somebody calls a bet from you, they've usually got a better hand. So let's say I'm in late middle position and I lead off the betting. I, I, I make a raise with ace eight. Mm -hmm. Somebody folds, somebody folds, but then somebody calls me. Well, they're not going to call with a worse hand than ace eight unless they're a very loose player. So a little alarm bell should go off in your head. Now, if you see a flop and if you think they're a weak player and they've missed it, then sure, have a continuation bet, try and knock them out. But if it came down, say, 
with an ace in it, then suddenly your ace eight looks pretty weak because this guy may have been calling you with an ace and if he had an ace, it's a better ace than yours. So you've got to be mentally alert, always on your toes. Great, well, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Action from the 2006 British Poker Open here, a star-studded table. Noah Bokin from the Netherlands has the button. George Fraser, first to act, gets out of the way. Gary Jones follows suit, and now uh, John Gale, a bracelet winner in 2006 out in Las Vegas while well, he reaches for chips and decides to bump it up with the King Queen. Rose, Rose to 11 in total. Noah has a playable hand if there hadn't been a raise, but uh, doesn't like his Queen 10. But look at Hansen, he's raised it up with jacks. Now should Koresh fold here because there's someone to act behind him? Yes, that's right. Koresh would have liked his sevens pre-flop. He's seen Hansen, an aggressive player, raise him. Now, maybe if it was just Gus, he could call with those sevens. But with Gale, who's already raised into this spot, still to act behind him, and possibly about to go all in, that would be a situation Koresh wouldn't fancy with just pocket sevens. And as we can see, he made the right decision. Now it's just down to John Gale. Does he think Gus is making one of his famous moves with low cards? This actually would be pretty much a coin toss. Jacks against King Queen. You're too dangerous to double up. Gus could equally have ace king, so that's a very, very good lay down. This is a hand from later in that very same tournament. We see George Fraser on the button. All in. All in. He's got a jack queen off suit and he is putting it all in. All you can eat, says George. It's not the strongest hand, but he's getting short stacked. Now, Gary Jones has picked up pocket fours. Gary's got more chips than everybody else. And he should really just call here because there's enough in there to frighten off Noah unless Noah has a hand. Now, we can see it, but Gary can't. Noah Bokin has got aces. He's got the best possible starting hand you can have. And this is why Gary needs to protect himself. He's only got pocket fours. I'm all in. All in. Gary announces he's all in. I've got pocket fours. He's all right against one player as a coin toss, but the two of them in there, he knows he's going to see overcards. The chances of someone getting a higher pair are enormous. And I'm afraid Gary got greedy there, trying to frighten off Noah, and he should never have made that move. So, Grub, do you have any other poker tips for us? Yes, I do. There are plenty to learn, and perhaps one of the most important in a long tournament is the ability to change gears. You mustn't become predictable. If your opponents know that you're only going to raise with aces or kings, then they're just going to fold and you're not going to maximise your profits. If they know they can bully you, if they know you're a loose player, once they get a good identikit picture of you, then they'll find it much easier to exploit your weaknesses and indeed avoid your strengths. Uh, then I'd also urge people to concentrate on their table. Sometimes if you're in a big tournament, lots of tables there, possibly with some famous players or perhaps one of your friends on another table, you can start hearing a ruckus over there and looking up and say, well, I wish I could go over there and see what's happening and oh, someone's going to get knocked out, there's a big all-in. Watch it on TV afterwards or hear about it in the bar. You have to have maximum concentration on your table. Now, thirdly, if you're lucky enough to double through, through a few times and get yourself a big chip stack, you have to use that as a weapon. It's not a wall to hide behind and just be safe. It's a cudgel to beat your opponents with. You've got to be putting the shorter stacks into uncomfortable positions. You've got to be putting them all in. And there's very few hands they can call you with. You're going to get respect because you've got all these chips. They are going to fear you. Poker is a game where you want to be feared. You want to be the bully. You want to be the bad man. <laughs> Lastly, it's about maximising your winnings. You don't want to overbet the pot. If you are lucky enough to flop a full house or a flush, don't shovel too much money in there. You're not going to have many opportunities to make a lot of chips, so when you see one, you've got to put in what we call value bets. You want people to be calling you in these golden moments when you know you're well nigh unbeatable. Great, well let's look at an example from the World Speed Poker Open. Four players around the table, each with only 15 seconds to act, and Carlo Citroni folds under the gun. So we're round to Bolstad, who folds on the button, 
And Dave Colclough in the small blind. Ten total. He raises Six it up more. to 10,000 with the ace king suited. Now he's made that tempting enough for Chesser oh. to call from the big blind with his ace seven. Now an ace would be an excellent king. card. And there is ace, ace king, king for Dave Colcroft. Now he should really put the brakes on here. He doesn't want to overbet it and scare off the plump Eight. rabbit he's got in his sights. And that is a perfect bet, 8,000. That's less than he bet pre-flop, remember. So hopefully Chesser will interpret this as weakness. And indeed he does make the call. Four. The four Actually, there two. makes no difference to anyone's hand. Dave bets out. Again, it's quite modest compared 18. to the size of the pot. 18,000. Now, Chesser will have observed the weakness Dave showed with a smaller bet on the flop than the one he made pre-flop. He may put him on any pair except an ace. He'll think his ace is good. Cool. The time pressure is there, and it makes him call. Cool. And that is another two. Another two. Action on two. Well, if Dave had ace-queen, that would be a scare card. He'd think, well, at best, we're going to chop this because the... We both have aces and twos with a king kicker. But Dave's got ace king. He's got the top two pairs. So he knows this is 32. now just about making a nice tempting bet. He's bet 32,000. Now that's heftier than his other bets. He wants to make money. He obviously wants to convert this hand into, oh, into chips. Bet. But again, if he'd bet 100,000, Chesser it's couldn't fall. That was perfect betting by it's Dave Colclough. He chose just the right amount. Any more, and his opponent would have folded. Any less, and the guy might have thought he was slow playing. And Grope, any poker player dreads the word bubble boy. Can you explain to us exactly what that means? Yes, if you're in a tournament where the top six players at the end of it get paid, and you finish seventh, you're on the bubble. That means you're just outside the money, and it's the worst thing to be in poker. But of course, you can use that to your advantage. Let's say you get to a final table of 10 players, and you know that only six of them are going to get paid. Well, everyone who's got a short stack is going to be very, very tight, and that gives you such an edge. If you know what's going on in their head, it doesn't really matter what cards they have. Brilliant. Well, that's it for this part. Join us after the break, and we'll be taking you on the final step on our poker ladder.